Good evening and welcome to Discover the Joy. I'm Paul Harrell and we're very thankful that you're letting us be a part of your lives tonight. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 24, verse 4. Luke chapter 24, verse 4. If you don't have a Bible, please feel free to call that number at the bottom of the screen and we'd love to send you one. That same number is also for prayer. Now listen to Mom. Good, good evening. And each week on Discover the Joy, we come together and hopefully there's some that keep watching and, and we're studying the Word of God. We don't uh, pretend or even uh, think that we know everything about the Word of God, but we do love the Word of God and love to study it. And there's a special blessing for God's people who study His Word. And of course, for those who are lost that may think you accidentally tuned in here, there's no accidents. Uh, <clears throat> God's Word, it says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God, this is the most important book in the entire world. It has lasted longer than any book in the world. It has, uh, many people have tried to stomp it out. They've tried to uh, get rid of it. Many messengers have been killed, but they could not get rid of the message which comes from God's Word. And as Paul's already mentioned tonight, that, that we, we think and we know from the Word of God that it's important enough that we try to make sure that if someone uh, does not have the uh, ability to or and the money to buy a Bible, that we uh, send you a Bible, and it will be similar to this. And uh, because God's Word is that important to us, and as Paul mentioned, we send it free of charge. Now, before we begin our study tonight, and we're finishing up the book of Luke, we've been in it a very long time because we believe in doing a verse-by-verse -verse study. Uh, that's uh, how actually, if you'll take time each and every day to spend time in the Word of God, that you get to know God and you are forming that intimate, personal relationship with Him for those who already know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Father, we come to you tonight and I praise you as God Almighty. Father, there, there is no other God but the one true and living God. You are creator of all. Father, you deserve our worship, our praise, and Father, uh, in any way that we might be able to serve you while we have time here on earth. Father, we sometimes become so busy with the things of the world that uh, we don't even take time to think about you. And Father, without you, we do not even have the privilege of the next breath. Father, I pray tonight that you will take us away from the cares of the world, that we will focus on your word. And Father, I don't know who may be watching the program, but you know. You know each and every one of us. You not only know us, you see into our hearts. You uh, know all about us. Father, I pray tonight that needs will be met, that bondages will be broken, and Father, that spiritual growth and salvation will come to those who need it. Thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, last week, uh, we were, we, of course, you know, uh, it's been the crucifixion of Jesus Christ for those of you who may not have been with us before or that was not able to be, uh, watch the program last week. Jesus has been crucified. Joseph of Arimathea has requested the body from Pilate, uh, the body of Jesus, and uh, he has taken him and placed the body in his own tomb in a garden. And that was fulfillment of scripture because we read over in Isaiah 53 where Jesus, where God said that Jesus, the uh, promised Messiah, would be buried with the rich. And actually, we read in Matthew last week, I believe it was Matthew 27, where it says that Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. So every thing that the word of God says is true. When God makes a promise, he's going to keep that promise. He promised that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would come to this earth and that he would pay for, man, for all mankind's uh, sin debt. 
He fulfilled that. He's promised to come back again. And he is going to fulfill that. And that's drawing nearer and nearer. Well, <clears throat> uh, in the end of uh, chapter 23, Joseph places uh, the body of Jesus in the tomb, which, as I've mentioned, was uh, like a cave, more or less. It was hewn out of a of a rock cliff or something and you could walk through it and there would be like a ledge where they could lay the body. He, wa he wasn't buried underground. He was buried in, in the tomb that they used uh, at, during that uh, day and time in Israel. And then we talked about old, old death sitting there in the garden. Old Satan there thought they were having a victory party. There was a party in hell, I'm telling you when Jesus Christ died because they thought they, Satan thought and his demonic angels that have followed him uh, thought they had won a victory. But they were soon to find out differently. And so death also has no victory any longer over those of us who believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins and believers do not have to fear death because Jesus Christ has already conquered that for us. Yes, we will pass from this life into the next. But I firmly believe that he sends his angels, and I think it, on some occasions that in many occasions that the faithful servants of God actually see Jesus as they're dying. But it's, it's in the twinkling of an eye. It, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's no holding area as some religions teach today. There, uh, there's no purgatory any longer because Jesus Christ He's defeated death, hell, and the grave, and so no longer can it hold us as it once could have. <clears throat> well, then we found in the first three verses of Luke that because uh, it was the uh, Sabbath that, was, uh, that came about, no one, it, was, it was a practice for women and others to go when someone died, their friends, their relatives, and they would take oils and perfumes and they would anoint the body uh, to, because we know that once the spirit leaves the body, this is nothing but an old shell, a house. It's the physical part that, we, that the real being, the real person lives in. And as it starts decaying, it, there's, there's a stench. There is a stench of death. And I'm thankful today that Jesus Christ conquered death for us. But the practice was where we're embalmed today, if we're going to be buried, if we're not cremated, they would anoint the body with oil, but they couldn't do it immediately because I'm sure that Joseph had to hurry and get the body because he had to go to Pilate, request, request the body, because often there was um, criminals who were crucified and no family, no friends requested the body and they were just thrown on a uh, burning heap outside the city. So Joseph of Arimathea knew he had, he only had a certain amount of time before uh, the nightfall to get the body of Jesus into the tomb. And then the women knew that they could not do anything on the Sabbath because it was against the law, the Jewish law, for them to, con anything that was considered work to be carried out on the Sabbath. So they had to wait. So there came, as I mentioned last week, day one, Satan's having a ball. Day two, death thinks that he's won the victory. Day three comes, but let me tell you, resurrection morning is on its way, and we found that on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, and I'm sure that was at first light, there's these women, and they go to the garden where they, they have watched where Joseph laid the body of Jesus. They loved Jesus. He was their teacher. He, was, he had opened their eyes. He had opened their spiritual eyes, and, they, and we will find out a little bit later on some of the things that he had done for some of these women. So they revered him. They loved him, and they had gone to anoint the body, but <clears throat> when they get there, they find that the body of the Lord Jesus is not in the tomb. And of course, their first thought is, oh my goodness, uh, 
Pilate or some of his officials or either the, some of the Jewish leaders that hated Jesus and did not believe that he was the promised uh, Messiah, that they were thinking that he has, they have stolen the body of Jesus. See, they were so fixed upon their own sorrow, upon the death of Jesus, Upon wondering what was going to take place yet, uh, next, they had forgotten all about his words and message to them. So in verse 4 of chapter 24 of Luke, it says, While they were wondering about this, wondering what happened to the body of Jesus, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. And we finished with this last week. And actually, these were angels, and they had taken on uh, the form of, of a man. But apparently they were, they, it says, the Bible says that they were enclosed, but they gleamed like lightning. In other words, there was something very mystical and, uh, about these two men, these two angels. In fact, the women were frightened, it says in verse 5. They bowed down and <clears throat> their faces to the ground before these two angels. And... Then the angel said to the women in uh, the latter part of verse 5, Why do you look for the living among the dead? See, there is resurrection power. The real being never dies. The, like I said, this body is nothing but an earthly habitation for the real person, the spirit, the soul of mankind, the heart. And so the real person, the real being of everyone that has ever lived, will eat with that when they die, they will either go one or two places, and that's heaven or hell. And you say, well, if God's such a loving God, why did he create hell? He created hell for Satan and the demonic angels who followed him and who uh, reared their ugly heads, you might say, against Jesus Christ. But because man sinned in the garden, there, those who reject Jesus Christ will also go to hell. Those who accept Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made at Calvary will be forever and ever and ever with God Almighty in his heaven that's prepared now. Jesus said, if I, if I have to go, I am coming again, and where I am, ye will be also. And he was talking to his disciples, to his followers. If you have accepted Jesus Christ, you are a disciple, a follower of Jesus. Now, you make a choice whether you're a good disciple or one that's not very good. A disciple should be a follower, but today uh, Satan has, made, has done so many things, and one of the things that he's used most is busyness to keep people so busy they do not take time or have time for God. So we have to be disciplined enough to set aside some of our time each day to fellowship with the Lord in Bible study and in prayer. Uh, in fact, just this past Sunday, uh, Paul and Cindy and, and their children, two little boys, came over to the house for lunch, and uh, they brought me a new uh, journal for this year uh, that I could journal in each day. You can write down uh, dates that are going to be important. Uh, but what I'm using it for uh, is each morning when I do my Bible study, wherever that might be in the Word of God, God will bring a, especially one or two verses that really speaks to my heart for that day. And I'm writing those verses down. Why am I doing that? Because it's important, and it's important to me. And it will help determine what kind of disciple or follower I will be of Jesus Christ in the days that I have remaining on this earth. But, <clears throat> so, you know what? But all of, most, a lot of you know that my husband Jim, he had this program for probably 12 years or 10 or 12 years, I can't remember. Uh, and he went on to be with the Lord about almost three years ago. And uh, so I don't feel compelled. His body, not him, his body is buried in a nice cemetery at Pine Bluff where his, the rest of his family is buried. I do not have 
the need to have to go to that cemetery daily to visit him because why seek ye the living among the dead he is was never more and your loved one if they were saved or will never be more alive than the day they enter heaven in the presence of almighty god we will be more alive than we've ever been and so that that brings such reassurance and joy to us and then in verse 6 he said he is not here he has risen and I'm quite sure these women they're in shock what do you mean he's risen and then the angels say remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee and that when when they mentioned to him remember that is an admonishment for them to recall the things that Jesus had told them. He had told them numerous times that he was going to be crucified, but on the third day he was going to be resurrected by the power of Almighty God. And once that took place, the work at Calvary, paying for our, he took our sins, paid our sin debt. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And then when he came forth from the grave, he conquered death, hell, and the grave for you and for me. And so these angels are, are encouraging these. Remember what he said. Remember, his body's not been stolen. Remember what he told you. And so it was kind of a... Uh, it, it was an admonishment, and it was also uh, kind of like a little slap on the hand. Do you Have you forgotten so quickly what God said to you? And I'm going to tell you, though, when we are so encumbered with problems, with sorrow, with the things that are going on in our life, and we do not keep our focus on the Lord, we too will forget the things that we've been taught from his word and so we need to recall and remember what God has told us remember listen carefully remember in the dark what you've been promised through God's word from the light of the truth of his word this world is growing darker and darker and darker each day from with sin because we have pushed Christ back more and more and more and more. You will never need the word of God more than you will in the days ahead because our society is going down a path that we have never encountered before. And that's going to be where God is removing his protective hands from this country. I'm not talking about the entire world. I'm talking about America who said we were founded on Christian principles and that no longer stands. And whose fault is that? It's our fault. That is our fault because we have allowed other groups, other religions to push their way in and push God out. And we've stood by and let it happen. I am admonishing you tonight to remember the things that you've heard about Jesus Christ from his word. It's truth. There are denominations. There are groups that say, well, I think part of God's word is true, but I don't know about all of God's word being true. I am telling you tonight that it is God's word. God's word is truth. God cannot lie. From Genesis 1 to the end of the book in Revelation, it is all true. And you say, well, you know, I don't know about that. I kind of believe in evolution. Really? Well, I'm going to tell you what, if you want to think that you evolved from a monkey, you go right ahead. But I know from the book of Psalms that I am wonderfully and majestically created by the God of this universe. He knew me, as the psalmist said, when I was in my mother's womb. He knew that if I was going to have a heart for him, he knew the day that I accepted him. 
and he started molding me and making me and shaping me and things didn't happen in my life just by just by luck there is no luck it's God's either allowed it and filtered it through his hands or you've been blessed that you can get over having luck you are either blessed or the trials that have come into your life God's going to take those and use them because we live in a sin fallen world to make you into the image of his son Jesus Christ now <clears throat> I've said it before and I will say it again there are going to be murderers, there's going to be adulterers, there's going to be liars. You can, thieves, robbers, you can name whatever sin that you want to name. They, those people, there's going to be all of that in hell. But that's not going to be what sent them to hell. What causes any person to go to hell is that they have rejected the sacrifice that Jesus Christ paid for at Calvary. See, Jesus died for all sinners. Jesus died for all sin. He died for the thief. He died for the, uh, those that robbed others. He died for those that had committed murder. He died for those that are in bondage, that, that are so in bondage tonight to drugs to alcohol and Satan is using all that in a mighty way in our society today you will never be set free unless you go to the foot of Calvary and you actually can be in bondage to a drug to alcohol and 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 have been saved but the way that took place in your life is that let's say this bottle of water is Jesus Christ and how you became in bondage or to an addiction or whatever is that instead of staying up here close to Jesus Christ, you began to get farther and farther and farther away from him. Farther and farther away. And the further you got away, the less that you could see his glory, the less that you could see his power. But see, Jesus never gives up on us. He's still wooing you through the Holy Spirit to come back to him. And through his power, he can set you free tonight of whatever it is that has you in his grasp. See, he wants you to turn to him where he can grasp you in his all-powerful love. Well, so he tells them, he said, he's not here, he's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still <coughs> with you in Galilee? that the Son of Man must be, de must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be, ra be raised again. <coughs> Excuse me. And then they began to remember. Now, see what, what they had forgotten in the darkness of the sorrow of the death of Jesus the Holy Spirit is now working in the, to bring it back to light, what he really said. He said that not only will I be crucified, but on the third day I'm going to be resurrected. So now they are beginning <coughs> to remember his words. And I'm quite sure then, as it dawned on them, it really happened just as he said, <coughs> It says when they, in verse 9, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others. And I like the way um, Ironstone, as I was reading in one of his uh, books, commentaries the other day, that notice when they come back to the 11, they told them all things, all the things that they had seen and heard. See, just a few days before, there had been 12. But Judas had been the one that betrayed Jesus. And after he betrayed Jesus, the 30 pieces of silver that he had been paid to betray Jesus had no value to him any longer. He didn't want it anymore. He took it back and he threw it at the feet of those who had given it to him. And then he goes out and he hangs himself. See... The things of this world is only going to bring satisfaction just for a short time. You may think more money in the bank is going to make me happier. That new car will make me happier. Moving up to the better neighborhood will make me happy. It may for a short time. 
You may be caught up in all that for just a little while, but then it's going to lose its glitter. It's going to lose all of the fascination that Satan had made it glisten with at one time just as the 30 pieces of silver glittered in the hands of those who paid it to Judas. And then all of a sudden, he realized, I don't want 30 pieces of silver. I've done the unthinkable, but yet he never repented, and he goes out and hangs himself. And you say, well, he couldn't have been saved anyway. Yes, he could have. Jesus' death at Calvary was more than enough to save Judas Iscariot. Jesus' death at Calvary is more than enough to clean your life up and to make you clean before a holy, righteous God. But you have to say, I want it. And so we find out in verse 10, it was Mary Magdalene, uh, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. So there was quite a number of, of women who had gone, that had followed Jesus, that had loved him. Let me tell you a little bit about those who went to anoint the body of Jesus, who was uh, showing their love and respect for Jesus. Mary Magdalene, it me mentions first, she had been delivered from seven demons by Jesus Christ. Apparently she was a wealthy woman because from that time on she apparently followed Jesus and helped support his ministry. Luke 8, chapter, <coughs> and Luke, Chapter 8, verse 2, you can find that. Mary Magdalene, who would love Jesus more <coughs> than someone who had been enveloped, had been possessed by seven demons and then set free. It was Jesus who did that. And then Joanna. A lot of, most people don't know who Joanna was. Joanna was the wife of Chusa, and she... Chusa, her husband, was the manager of Herod's household. Herod, the one who had had John the Baptist beheaded. And yet Jesus Christ in his saving power had set her free from that life of darkness. And it says Mary, the mother of James, her son, served Jesus Christ. See, these were... Sin had, at one time, they were just ordinary sinful women who the love of Jesus, the life of Jesus had changed. That's all I was, a sinful person who with her spiritual eyes went to the cross of Calvary and asked Jesus to save her, save her. He's waiting to do that for you tonight. <laughs>